Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Worthington SDA Church located at 385 East Dublin Granville Road in the city of Worthington. We would like to take this opportunity to recognize all of our guests, visitors and friends who have decided to worship with us today. We'd like to say welcome to our friends who took the time to worship with us through our live streaming service. Thank you for participating in our worship experience. Please stop by at any of our services whenever you visit us in Columbus, Ohio. To our friends who are visiting with us today, we would love to get to know you. So please let us know who you are. You could use our connection card, get to know our pastors, our staff, or speak to one of our greeters and deacons. We'd love to get to know you. Now I'd like you to refer to your bulletins as I go through a few of the many announcements that we have today. Tonight, the middle schoolers have a Nerf Wars event and it starts from 8 p.m. tonight and ends at 10 p.m. and this will be held in the fellowship hall. All middle schoolers, you're invited to attend. I'm sure many of you saw the extravagant display in our church foyer and that is for our vacation Bible school which is scheduled to begin from July 15th to the 20th and they are currently looking for volunteers. So please sign up. Today at the Mount Vernon Hill Church, there is going to be a special screening called Come Before Winter about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You are all invited to attend. It begins at 3 p.m. Also, you will see in your bulletin that we are going to be having an ordination service for our youth pastor, Jeremy Wong, on Sabbath, March 31st at 4 p.m. Please come on out. Let's support our youth pastor as he approaches this milestone in ministry. I want to also let you know that we're having communion service on Easter weekend, March 31st, and you're all invited to attend. So please um, make note of that. Also, I want to let you know that today is Children's Church Day. Yay! Okay, I'll say it again. Today is Children's Church Day. Woo, look around. You'll see why I'm saying it's Children's Church Day. <laughs> okay, all children are invited to attend. There's going to be a special, it looks like a St. Patrick's Day kind of theme thing going on. I don't know. Also, our Worthington Wildcats. Yay! I guess I'm the only one excited about our Worthington Wildcats. Let's try that again. Our Worthington Wildcats. Today, they are going to be doing the um, union level of the PBE experience. And they're going to be doing this at the Blue Mountain View Academy. And if they make it, they're going to head down to Florida, I believe, for the division level. So let's pray for them. Let's pray for traveling mercies. And let's hope they win. Amen. Amen. That's a good thing, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> there will be a small group training, and we're hoping to have that on Sabbath, April 14th. I know your bulletin says the 24th. That was a mistake. But on Sabbath, April 14th, after potluck, there will be a small group training session. And if you're interested in small groups, if you want to start a small group, you are invited to attend that small group session. There'll be more details in the coming weeks. Guys, I'd like you to read your bulletins. There's so much stuff in here. I don't have the time. I will be yanked off the stage by Pastor Julian. Um, so please read your bulletins. Sign up for our newsletter. Please follow us on Facebook. Thank you to the 61 persons who signed up for us on Facebook. We love you, but we wanted to get to 100. I'm just saying that. Amen. Have a great Sabbath, everyone. This is all said, hymn 474. Let's sing it out. Take the name of Jesus with you.
Everybody with me. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and calm forgive you. Take it in where you go. Precious name, precious name, precious is we. Oh, how sweet, oh, the hope of joy of heaven. Precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, the hope of joy of heaven. Just a second, are you out there? I know the weather is horrible this morning, but it's still the Sabbath day, the ice is gone. And it's warm in here. You guys look so delightful and everything. The pastor's wife has on her green. I see green over the place. I don't have any green on, maybe a couple of teeth. But other than that, help me sing this song here. It's a joyful song, okay? Second stanza. Take the name of Jesus ever As a shield from every snare. Much better. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, precious name, oh how sweet, oh how sweet, hopes of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, third stanza. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it fills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ. Precious name, precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, how sweet, Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, last stanza. At the name of Jesus bow, we falling prostrate at his knees. King of kings and help we read on him when our journey is complete. Precious name, precious name, oh how sweet, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Now that we've finished it, I want us to sing the chorus by itself. And this song we'll sing, precious name, precious name, oh how sweet, oh how sweet. Follow me? All right, we're going to do it that way. The chorus, go ahead. Pre precious name, oh how sweet, oh the hope of joy of heaven precious name precious name oh how sweet oh how sweet oh the hope of joy of heaven thank you you've heard it said Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. As much as you are able, please kneel with me for prayer. Father, this morning in Worthington, we come and bow before you to take a minute away from our busy schedules and lives to come together on Sabbath and focus on you, to think about you, to spend time with our friends and family here, Lord. I pray today that you would bless our pastor as the word is given to us. I pray that you would bless the children at Children's Church, that they would receive a special blessing. I pray for those at home watching on TV or on their computer.
for those in the hospital who cannot be here today or those who are at, that are sick this morning. Lord, the, the church family in Worthington here spreads all around the world. So all of our friends and family, brothers and sisters who aren't here with us this morning, may you touch their hearts with a special Sabbath blessing and let them know that this morning that they are part of our family here and we are thinking of them and we pray your blessing upon them this morning. Father, we know around the world there continues to be all, all, all kinds of strife, pain, suffering, and death. Lord, everywhere we look, we see the results of sin around us, Lord. We, to get, we believe, Lord, that you're coming again soon. We believe especially that we have so little time left to share your message with those around us. I pray in the time that we have between now and the time that you come again to take us home, that we would spend that time trying to share your love, doing mercy, loving those who persecute us, forgiving those who have hurt us, and reaching out in love. I pray that you would give us opportunities as we go through our weeks to share that love with those around us. Lord, may our ministry in this church and our interactions with our brothers and sisters in the world continue to fill this church and grow this church until the day that you come back. I pray a special blessing today on our leaders, Lord. We don't have, we all, we, we, we believe that there is no um, end in sight for this world that will do anything or bring us any closer to peace except that you will return and take us all home with you. I pray that you would bless those that have power and those in leadership, Lord, and I pray that you would soften their hearts with love and give them just a piece of the message you brought us with your life's ministry on this earth, Lord. If all of us could just reach out a little bit more kindly to one another, what a world we could create for you here on this planet. Lord, uh, thank you for this Sabbath day, and thank you again for all of your mercies, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I'll ask the deacons to come forward at this time to collect our, our uh, morning offerings. Uh, there is a, um, a summary statement in your bulletin of where we're at for the year to date. Um, as you can see, we are a little bit behind for our year to date. I was saying at our last church board meeting that I really wish we could spend more time uh, enjoying the fact that we uh, finished last year uh, strongly. We finished ahead of our expenses and uh, had a little bit of money to put away for the next year, uh, which is wonderful. But uh, as we turn the page from December to January, we start a new uh, uh, fiscal year in our church because our church runs on a calendar year fiscal year. So as we open the books for 2018, we have to continue to be diligent to um, remember the, church, the church's local budget. Um, the local budget is what pays for all the ministries here in Worthington. It is important to tithe. It is important to continue to support the global church, the state church, the world church, of course. But re please remember that the church budget, the local church budget here in Worthington is what supports our, uh, our school and our daycare and our ministries, the Sabbath school programs, the, uh, the praise band, all the outreach ministry that we do, health ministries, uh, pathfinders, all those things are funded through local church budget. So please continue to remember to give diligently and um, faithfully to our local church budget. Please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for a chance to come together this morning, Lord. I pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings. I pray that you would multiply them and that you would use the money that is brought in to your honor and glory. Thank you, Lord, uh, for all that you've done for us, and please keep us faithful till the end. Amen.
as we see some fruits are coming here and uh, I'm here on the stage just to tell you that uh, this uh, Patrick's Day looking fruit here to my left has a special occasion uh, and I have a small token as a present for, uh, to her. Uh, we have one person that has chosen uh, to help her husband remember her birthday. So she decided to get married on exactly her birthday. And uh, this is no one else but uh, Chappie. I don't, I, I don't know if you can recognize her, but this is uh, uh, Chaplain Brooke Wong. And uh, Jeremy is not here today. Uh, he's with the kids uh, competing in the Bible Bowl uh, on the union level. But on behalf of our congregation, Brooke, I would like to congratulate you on your birthday and your anniversary, wedding anniversary, and to wish you many more birthdays. And of course, we cannot match the celebration you had on your birthday a few years ago when you got married, but at least we love you as much as these people who were there at your wedding. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is time now for children's stories, so boys and girls, please come on down. In case you can't tell, I am actually a pineapple. A pineapple. Angels sit on the front row, and kids come sit right up here on the stage, okay? Angels sit on the front row. Right here, honey. I wondered why there was so many green accessories. I just thought everybody wanted to be a pineapple, but it dawned on me later why there was so much green. Boys and girls, what is this? It's an egg, right? Should you be gentle with an egg? What's going to happen if you're not gentle? What's going to happen if, for example, you go like this? Oh, no. What happened? It broke, right? You have to be really gentle and really careful when you're working with eggs. You might even go so far as to hold them with two hands. But did you know you also have to be gentle with the things that come out of these eggs? What happens if this egg actually incubates and hatches? What comes out? A chick, right? Now, I have a fair amount of experience raising sheep. Sheep are my favorite animals. I don't have any experience really with chickens. My dad and I wanted to get chickens when I was growing up, but my mom, she doesn't like chickens, so we decided against it. I don't know very much about chickens, but many, many years ago, in a far, far away place, I was asked to organize a petting zoo. And I knew there were going to be lots of kids coming there who were not familiar with animals. And I wanted them to be able to pet animals and touch animals and have a good time. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool, because it was the spring, wouldn't it be cool if I got some chicks for the kids to look at and maybe even to hold? I knew I'd have to tell the kids to be really, really gentle. But boys and girls, I didn't have any experience. That was the problem. And this was down in Tennessee. I know that you have to have a heat lamp to keep chicks warm, but it was Tennessee. And Tennessee is always warm, right? Except for when it isn't. But most of the time it is. And it was a nice warm day. So I was really excited and I got these chicks and I took them to the petting zoo with no heat lamp. I got six little chicks. Six little chicks and a thousand people came through my petting zoo. Oh, it was a great time. They were all there for a big Easter pageant. This was just a little part, but they came through and the children said, oh, look at the chicks, they're just so cute. Can I touch them? Can I hold them? And we made sure they were very gentle with the chicks. Well, I had somebody that was gonna take the chicks home for me because I couldn't keep them. I was living on campus. I had somebody that was gonna take the chicks home for me and he did, and boys and girls, I didn't find out until the next year, but 
this is terrible. I don't even want to tell you this. I'm very ashamed. The chicks died. Isn't that terrible? Chap, it is terrible. Chappie is a chicken killer. I felt so bad, boys and girls. You have to be so gentle with chicks. You have to keep them under a heat lamp. You can't stress them out too much. And I thought that it was okay because they looked relatively okay. They looked chick-like. They looked puffy and fluffy and they were cheeping and all that kind of stuff, jumping around and everything. But what I didn't know is that it was so much stress that it wasn't till later that they died. Boys and girls, they asked me to do the petting zoo the next year. I felt like a chicken murderer, but I agreed to do it again. But this time, I did some research on Google on how to keep the chicks alive. And I got them a heat lamp, even though it was 75 degrees outside. I made sure they had a heat lamp to keep them nice and warm. And we would change our chickens. Every time a new batch of kids came, we would change out the chickens. And we would only let them look at the chicks. They had to be very, very careful just to look. And we didn't let them scream and jump around and scare the chicks or anything like that even though they were excited we were very very gentle and boys and girls I am pleased to tell you that that year's batch of chicks lived you got to be very gentle with chicks but you also need to be very gentle with people and that's what we're going to talk about in children's church today now boys and girls our greatest example of gentleness comes from Jesus Jesus is very gentle with us amen Jesus is very gentle with us. And what we're going to do right now, we have some first graders and some extra friends from Worthington Adventist Academy. They're actually going to act out a story for us of Jesus being gentle with one of his friends, Jacob. So boys and girls, I'm going to ask first graders if you can go to the front. And boys and girls that are on this stage, I would like you to come and to sit in these pews right here, okay? You can sit in the first and the second row. First and second row. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. On the land on which you lie on, I will get to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in your, your offspring shall all the families of the Earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Is 
Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Boys and girls, now it's time for us to collect the children's offering, and we are heading to church. not a coconut fruit of the spirit's not a coconut if you want to be a coconut you might as well hear it you can't be a fruit of the spirit because the fruit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and gentleness and self-control love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and gentleness and self-control oh the fruit of the spirit's not a banana the fruit of the spirit's not a banana you want to be a banana? You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit. Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit is not a watermelon. The fruit of the spirit is not a watermelon. You want to be a watermelon. You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit. Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit is not a lemon. The fruit of the spirit is not a lemon. If you want to be a lemon, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Well, thank you very much for the, for the children. Thank, thank you very much to our uh, chaplain, Brooke Wong. And uh, the children are going to enjoy their children's church. And I would like to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Yulia Filipov, and I'm the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you so much for being here to worship with us. Before we begin, uh, may I invite you to sing with me so that we can get together into the spirit of worship. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a Sanctuary for you. Let's do it one more time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. I would like to invite the, our team upstairs to dim the lights. We're going to see our bumper video that introduces our series on the book of Genesis, and then we're going to begin with the sermon.
Heavenly Father, thank you very much for your word. And now that we are about to open it, open wide our hearts and minds to receive it. In the name of Jesus we pray, and all the saints of God said together, Amen. I would like to begin with this question. Please don't answer it. Uh, answer it for yourself. Don't answer it out loud. What is your attitude toward God, toward church, toward religion? When you have sinned, when you have done something really horrible, when you have done something you know God says we should never do. What is your attitude? As a pastor, I have often time the privilege and the painful privilege sometimes of a front seat view in the lives of some of our people. And some of these front seat views are when they're completely flat on their faces, fallen spiritually, emotionally, and sometimes physically. And I've noticed that when we sin, our natural reaction is to, to, to flee. Our natural reaction is to hide from God. Our natural reaction is to avoid Him. Because we think that at that time of our moral and spiritual failures, God does not like us. Today I'm hoping that the Word of God is going to change your perspective. I've titled my message today, Turning Pillows into Pillars. So would you please grab your Bibles, your electronic devices, and let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 27. We're going to read the last five verses of uh, chapter 27 and the first two verses of chapter 28. So Daniel is ready with the microphone. It's uh, white with blue stripes. And anyone who is willing to read, please lift up your hand and let's see. Margie, thank you, Marge. Let's hear your voice with a loud, preaching, clear uh, distinction. Esau. Hello? Yeah, it's working. Oh, it's working. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger brother Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with the living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Badan Aram, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Thank you, Margie. Esau was so outraged with Jacob stealing his uh, birthright, his blessings, that he was determined to kill his brother, his twin brother. Of course, <laughs> Esau was not a very private man. He let his emotions air. And knowing Rebecca, his mom, she was always close to the family grapevine, and she heard what Esau, her son, was planning to do to his brother. In her attempt to protect her pet son, Jacob, she sent him to a far-off country located 550 miles away from home. 
she told, uh, told Jacob, you're going to be there for a few days. The Bible tells us that these few days extended to 20 years. And by the time Jacob returned home, Rebecca was not alive to receive him. Jacob became a fugitive, fleeing from his own sin, from the consequences of his own sin. And I would like to tell you something, my friends. Sin is a very expensive commodity. It's readily available, and in our society, if something is abundant, it should be cheap, right? And yet, sin is the most expensive commodity in the universe. It is so expensive that the potentate of the universe, the almighty star breather, he had to lay down his life to pay off the price of sin. But sin is an expensive commodity, not just for the divine. Sin is an expensive commodity also for you and me. Sin is like a bomb that you strap on your chest and you think is going to kill just you. Sin always injures other people around us. Our sin, our private sins, always injure someone who is very close to us. And here is the first insight we glean from the story of Jacob and Esau. Don't ever toy with sin. It's a very dangerous explosive. It will tear you to pieces. It will bankrupt you spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Now let's continue with the story of Jacob and see uh, where he went after he left home. So who would like to read for us verses 10 through 15? Thank you, Mansi. Daniel is going to come to you, and we are going to hear your voice reading verses 10 through 15. From the NIV version, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father and Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Thank you, Mansi. Jacob ventured uh, on this 550-mile journey, a dangerous journey by himself, and the only thing he had is his stuff and probably just a little bit of food. He was not able to travel on this journey with a lot of possessions because his, father, uh, his uh, brother may be outraged seeing that he's already taken some of the family possession. The only thing he had in his hand was his stuff. This 550 mile journey by foot would have taken Approximately, uh, approximately a month for Jacob to accomplish. And yet, in the very first two days, he covered 60 miles. He was almost running. Jacob was afraid 
that his brother is going to catch up with him. Two days later, Jacob ended in a place that later will be called Bethel. Sixty miles later, Jacob decided to spend the night in a motel called Hard Rock Inn. Jacob was caught between a rock and a hard place, spiritually, emotionally, physically. The Bible tells us in verse 11, and Jacob taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head. The hard rock inn is a very hard place. It's a lonely place. It's a hurting place. It's a place where you realize that the blessings you were supposedly receiving are not that blessed as you thought. It's a place of dashed dreams and broken hopes. I can only imagine what Jacob has fe had felt knowing that he brought on himself this condition with his own scheming and stupidity. Have you ever been at the Hard Rock Inn? Did you need to make an extended stay at the Hard Rock Inn? A hard place. A place of regrets. A place where you realize that your own stupidity led you between the rock and the hard place. Lonely, exhausted, feeling deserted by, by God and everybody else, Jacob hugged his hard pillow and went to sleep. And then verse 12 tells us something amazing. And behold, a ladder was set up on earth and its top extended to heaven. Jacob discovered in the hard rock inn that he was not alone, that God was there with him and there were angels ascending and descending, ministering to his brokenness. The deceiver met God that night. And yet amazingly, the Lord mentions nothing about his spiritual failure, about his spiritual disaster, does not mention even a word of rebuke. To Jacob. He was only comforting him in his loneliness. I know some Christians who tell me that people in the Old Testament got justified by works, by keeping the law. And people in the New Testament are saved by grace. I'm here today to tell you that there has never been a human being that has been saved in any other way but by the mercy and the grace of God. And that night, Jacob was about to learn the gospel according to the ladder. I'm going to talk today a little bit about this gospel according to the ladder. And, but first I would like to mention something that is not very obvious. It's it's kind of hidden in the Hebrew text. I was looking for different Bibles that catch this very interesting motif, very interesting detail. But I didn't find any English or German or any other languages Bible that really emphasizes that. First, I would like to tell you that 
the ladder that um, Jacob saw was not the one that you buy from Menards or Home Depot. It's not like that. It's not the one you use to change the bulb on your porch. The ladder that he saw was a staircase. And to be even more precise, it was one of the staircases that the people at the Tower of Babel were trying to build. Oftentimes, this is referred to in the uh, biblical archaeology as ziggurat. This is a building that has staircases from outside. And the staircase ends on each floor and then continues from the next floor. So, Jacob saw something like that. But I would like to, to point here to the two details in the Hebrew text that tell us something interesting about this ladder. Uh, in Hebrew, there are two, uh, two parts of the sentence. The first sentence, uh, Jacob saw Sulam Mutzav Arza, which uh, I emphasize this uh, he at the end, which in Hebrew, for those of you who may watch or may know Hebrew, it's a directional he, which means God was telling him that this particular ladder began from heaven and was built from heaven down to earth. The building uh, begins from heaven down to earth. But then in the second uh, part of the sentence, we read something uh, opposite to that. Varusho Matsuaf Hashamaima, which means uh, at and the, the end, the top of this ladder was reaching the heavens, and when you read it in Hebrew, it indicates that the direction in which the ladder was built was from the bottom up. So which one is it? Was the ladder built from the bottom up or from the, from the sky down? Actually, both. How many of you remember that Jesus was called Son of God, right? You've heard that. And also he was called Son of Man. Because he was both. These two titles of, uh, of Jesus represented his divinity coming from above and his title Son of Man, his humanity coming from below. And Jesus himself taking this particular metaphor, speaking to one of his early disciples, he says in John chapter 1 verse 51, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending, in the Greek means, uh, basically implies ascending and descending using Jesus himself as a ladder of ascending and descending. Jesus is playing back on the, this picture that he is this ladder built from heavens down and from earth up. And later Jesus will say in uh, John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the ladder that Jacob saw. Now let me ask you, did Jacob climb the ladder? Do you remember the text? Did he climb? Who was climbing up and down the ladder? The angels. The New Testament happens to say that the angels are ministering spirits, ministering for our salvation. But this ministering on our salvation was possible only because Jesus became this bridge, this staircase between heaven and earth. On that night, when God appeared to Jacob, he was preaching to him the gospel according to the ladder. And he was telling him that you cannot reach heaven with your efforts. It is always God who takes the initiative of our salvation. It is not we who find God. It is he who finds us. Sometimes we think because we messed up in our lives, because we lay flat on our faces, broken, sinful, unworthy, that God cannot love that. 
And through the Jacob story, God is saying, sure I can. More than you know, sure I can. Now let's read Genesis chapter 28, verses 16 through 22. Genesis chapter 28, verses 16 through 22. Well, if nobody else, Margie is going to read for us again. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Margie, Margie it is, okay. Thank you, Margie, for saving us. So let's, let's hear uh, verses 16 through 22. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes. Uh, um, this is, you're reading a different chapter. What am I reading? Yes. I'm, oh, I'm reading 29. Sorry. Oh, I thought that was nice. So I could do. Uh, 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I safely return to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Thank you, Marge. Jake arose from his sleep, from his stony pillow, astonished. And you may say, why is he astonished? Let me tell you a little bit more about the gospel according to the latter. Jake arose from his stony pillow astonished because he was like us. When we mess up, when we sin, when we do things that God tells us not to do, we feel that God definitely has deserted us. We feel that God cannot love that. He can love the better version of me, but not the one that lays prostrate, fallen under sin. Especially not when it's my own fault for what happened. And God says, surprise, fleeing sinner, I care about you. Even when it's your own fault, I do care. Surprise, sinful sufferer. I care about your suffering even when it's your own fault. Surprise, evil schemer. I still love you even when you cannot forgive yourself and you cannot love yourself. Surprise, Faithless one, I'm still faithful, even though you are not. Next time when you lay flat on your face because you have compromised everything that you proclaim to believe in, and you think God cannot love that, be reminded, God is full of graceful surprises. I would like just to remind you about that through a few examples in the Bible. A young and very promising politician, military leader, and a PhD graduate 
from the University of Pharaoh. Next in line to become a Pharaoh, becomes a murderer. And he flees for, uh, for his life in a country far, far away. Only to show off with his PhD diploma to his only audience, bunch of sheep. And the leader who was called by God to become the freedom fighter and the political leader of Israel has fallen flat on his face. For 40 years, he is walking in the wilderness, tending to sheep instead of leading people. After committing murder, Moses was sure God cannot love that, not him. And he was sure that God was not interested in seeing him. Till one day, surprise of grace, God put down the ladder of grace in the middle of a burning bush and made out of the murderer the meekest and the best human leader humanity has ever known. God appears to Gideon, a coward who is hiding in his vineyard threshing wheat. No one does that. He was hiding because he was afraid of the enemy, of the Midianites. And God puts down his ladder of grace and out of the coward Gideon, he makes the most successful and crazily brave general. 300 soldiers defeat an army of 135,000, a ratio of 1 to 450, unheard in the history of war of humanity. And don't, don't tell me, oh, I, I remember, this, this is the 300 of uh, uh, Gerard Butler. No. Gerald, Gerald Butler and his crew, they stole the idea from this place. Because the battle of Thermopolis didn't happen this way. One day, a hateful murderer is riding on his way to Damascus. And the only thing on his mind and in his heart is hatred and vengeance. And suddenly, the Lord puts down the ladder of grace, interrupts this journey, and out of this hater and murder, He makes the most successful preacher of grace. God is still not done letting down his ladder of grace into our lives. Yet what is happening often is we are so used to not be loved, to not be forgiven, to not forgive ourselves and to see ourselves as not lovable that we cannot accept God's ladders of grace that he opens from time to time in our lives to reach to our hearts. So we just dust ourselves off and rush off as if nothing happened. You see, we all are Jacobs in some way. We are all people who often find ourselves fleeing from the consequences of our own sin. And even when we stumble upon the grace of God, we pick ourselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened.
Yet, luckily for uh, Jacob, in verse 18 we read, Jacob took the stone that he put under his head and set it up as a pillar. The rocky pillar that was watered with his tears of remorse, of regret, and brokenness. The, the pillow of suffering, the pillow of his own guilt was lifted up and was made a pillar of worship. A hard place became a shrine. A stone became an altar. And a fugitive became a pilgrim of faith. And this is probably one of the most amazing things about God and his ladders of grace. God loves to turn our pillows of shame, of failure, into shrines of his goodness and grace. I don't know what your pillows look like, but I know that your sufferings and your disappointments in life can become shrines of God's presence and memorials of his grace. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us later in chapter 35 that 20 years later when Jacob came back into the promised land, leading his children with him, they went to Bethel and he built an altar of God there. And I'm sure there were a lot of questions. Daddy, why do you build this thing here? What is the, the meaning of this upright stone? And Daddy had to tell them about his failure, about his disgrace and flight from sin into the arms of God's grace. And friends, I don't know what your pillows of shame and failure look like, but God knows. And I would like to ask you to not hide them, to lift them up, rise them up, and turn them into shrines of God's presence and grace. And preach about them to your children and grandchildren. Let them have a legacy. We often teach our children how to walk. We miss to teach them how to fall. Because oftentimes when we fall, under the weight of sin, we lay there forever and ever because nobody has ever taught us that with the grace of God, you can stand up. That the grace of God can do things that are humanly impossible. So next time when you're telling your children and grandchildren the great stories of your successes, teach them also your great stories of your failures. Not just as a moral story, how not to repeat your mistakes, but how to be able to stand up when they fall under the weight of sin. Jacob's rock hard pillow became a memorial of God's grace. What about yours? What are you doing with your failures? Are you still lying flat on your face? And every single time God opens the heavens and lets down his ladder of grace, you just say to yourself, yeah, I believe that God is love, but he cannot love that. Or like Jacob, you let God descend upon you and minister to you. And make you the man, make you the, the woman that will know how to teach others how to get up when they fall under the weight of sin. Today, I pray for you, I pray for me, I pray for all of us that we may become preachers 
of this boundless grace of God, first to ourselves and then to our children and grandchildren, to friends and foe, and proclaim the gospel loud and clear, and bring all children of God under the ladder of His grace. I would like to invite you to take out of your bulletin the yellow connection card. I hope you've put your name on the front of it. And I would like to invite you to turn it to the back and follow me and check the box, check the decision that applies to you the most. First, Lord, turn the places of my shame and failures into shrines of your goodness and grace. If I see your card coming with this checked, out, checked I'm going to pray for you. Second, I will use every sunset as an opportunity to reset my spiritual life. Whatever the day has brought to you, whatever failures you have been through, whatever disappointments you've been through, go on your knees at your bed in the evening and let the, this be a set of new beginning. This is why the, the Bible says the day begins with the sunset. Let it be a new day. Let it be a new day of grace and new beginning for you. And then rest in God's forgiveness, grasping firmly the hand of his, of his grace. And finally, Lord, when life scares me and I feel like a fugitive in this world, remind me that you are with me on this long journey. May God bless us all. to the hymn 473. Would you stand with me please and sing? First stanza. Nearer my God to Thee to thee e'en though it be a cross that raiseth me still all my song shall be nearer my God to thee nearer my God to thee Second, though like the wanderer, daylight all gone, darkness be over me, my rest a stone. Yet in my dreams I'd be to thee, nearer my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Ladies only now. Come on, ladies. Everyone now. Nearer my God to thee, nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. Sing with me now, men. Then with my waking thoughts, ride with thy praise. Out of my stony griefs, Bethel I'll raise. So by my woes to be everyone, nearer my God.
to thee, dear my God, to thee, dear to thee. Last stanza without the piano. Sing with me. Or if on joyful wing cleaving the sky, sun, moon, and star forgot a word I fly, still all my song shall be dearer my God to thee dearer my God to thee dearer to thee thank you let's bow our heads for the benediction please and now, to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before his presence in glory and in exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.